and welcome. I'm Trisha Edwards, Deputy Director of Smithsonian Affiliations, and I'm so glad to have you all with us today. We're pleased to welcome you to our program, Suffrage Stories, a complicated narrative about the suffrage movement and the stories of activists both familiar and less well known. I know it's going to be an interesting and timely discussion, especially as we recognize the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women or I should say some women, the right to vote. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items to mention. Um, the program is being recorded. Uh, the link to the program will be posted on the Smithsonian Affiliations YouTube page in the coming days. And we'll also send a link out along with additional resources um, as soon as we have them available. Um, if you have comments, please use the chat box. Um, if you have questions for our presenters, please use uh, put those in the Q&A. And you can find those in the Zoom toolbar, either at the bottom or the top of the screen. Um, and please note that while on-topic discussion is encouraged, we ask that you express yourself in a civil manner and treat others with respect. The Smithsonian monitors comments and may remove participants from the program in accordance with its terms of use. Um, and a link to the terms is now in the chat if you'd like to um, reference that. Um, if you have a technical issue or a question unrelated to today's discussion, please use the raise your hand feature or type it in the chat box and a Smithsonian staff member will be able to assist you. Um, Smithsonian Affiliations is pleased to host today's program in collaboration with the National Museum of the American Indian and the National Museum of American History. Um, and we have, we're delighted to have scholars from both museums as our featured speaker. This program is part of the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative, which aims to create a more equitable and just American society by creating, disseminating, and amplifying the historical record of the accomplishments of American women. At Smithsonian Affiliations, we partner with museums and cultural organizations across the country to support the needs and those to support their needs and those of their, your, their communities, people like you joining us today, while also furthering the Smithsonian's mission, the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Like the Smithsonian, our affiliate partners are committed to education and public service and work in collaboration with the Smithsonian to catalyze critical conversations in their communities and help us all better understand the world around us. This work seems more important now than ever as we, like all of you, grapple with so many big issues, including racial and social injustice, political divisiveness, and of course, the effects of a global pandemic. Today's program is a great example of the ways in which the Smithsonian and our affiliates work together to bring thought-provoking and relevant content to audiences like you. With the help of 13 affiliate organizations, we are able to serve many more people than we could with a single in-person program. And we are able to start a conversation not with one community, but across many, from Maryland to Oregon, North Carolina to Washington, and Oklahoma to Indiana. So again, please use the chat function because we really want to see, um, we really want to facilitate conversation not only um, between our presenters, but also with our audience. Now I'm delighted to turn the program over to Dr. Michelle Delaney, Assistant Director for History and Culture at the National Museum of the American Indian. In her role, Dr. Delaney ma manages the museum's research and scholarship team and leads the intellectual program development for exhibitions, educational programming, publications, and digital scholarship. She also directs strategic partners across the Smithsonian. And most relevant to tonight's discussion, she is the chair of the editorial committee for the 2019 book, Smithsonian American Women. You're seeing a photo of that on your screen now. Um, and we'll put, there's a link in the chat should you be interested in purchasing the book or learning more. And Michelle is also a current board member of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, which is a Smithsonian affiliate in Cody, Wyoming. Michelle? Thank you, Tricia. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to say thank you to the staff of affiliations, Smithsonian affiliations, especially Tricia Edwards and Laura Hansen for conceiving this program and bringing us together tonight. I'm so proud to see that book cover on the screen. We have worked so hard over the last few years to pull it together and it's a great team effort. So I hope you enjoy this evening. 
um, very much. It's uh, an evening to commemorate the centennial of the 19th Amendment and American women's suffrage. Um, I'm pleased to moderate the discussion with a few of my best Smithsonian colleagues researching women's history at the Smithsonian and bringing to the forefront a fuller and more diverse range of suffrage stories represented throughout the collections of our museums and research centers. It was three years ago that I proposed a book concept for Smithsonian American Women as part of the Smithsonian's American Women's History Initiative, hashtag because of her story. The initiative formed quickly following November uh, 2016 Congressional Commission report, which discussed the potential for a National Women's History Museum. Deep within the report was a statement, a statement that the Smithsonian should prepare for a potential museum with a five-year initiative to survey collections, hire additional curatorial staff, and increase exhibitions and programming focused on American women's history. Because of her story launched in March of 2018, with a powerful event and inaugural donation of items from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, thanks mostly to our participant tonight, Lisa Kathleen Grady, who curates the Women's History Collection at the National Museum of American History. The Smithsonian American Woman Book Team was already well into book uh, design by early 2018, with a year of meeting and selecting of objects already done by then. It was my intent to build on a successful model of our Smithsonian Civil War 150 team project to introduce curatorial and scholarly staff to each other by building a strong book editorial committee and to initiate a first survey of women's history objects across the institution. All this was in preparation to have an overarching Smithsonian publication ready for the centennial of the 19th Amendment in 2020, and we did it. American women's history has achieved a new order of importance at the Smithsonian. Our curators are committed to acquiring, displaying, and interpreting objects that tell the stories of women, women of all races and gender expressions, many of whose achievements were hidden or underappreciated in the past. Reflecting the spirit of the new American Women's Initiative, the book charts territory in exploring diverse women's lives through the myriad of collections at Smithsonian. Colleagues answered my call to action. The book collaboration represents an impressive 100 scholars from 17 museums, archives, research centers that interpret individual objects, collections, and stories of the unique holdings of the institution that bring to life the remarkable and varied experiences of women. When we came together to work on the book to commemorate the centennial, we quickly realized that we wanted a book to cover more than the amendments and the laws. We wanted the book to reflect the millions of individual choices, actions, emotions that women experience every day and that influence and are influenced by the world in which they live. Themes quickly emerged. Women's rights of passage, their roles as trailblazers, activists, and professionals in the workplace. Their significant responsibilities at home, in their communities, represent an agency, self-care, self-expression, Smithsonian American Women includes objects representing suffrage, but also represents a broad look at the diverse experiences of American women, as well as the politics of and the challenges to inequality. Women continue to innovate, challenging power and inequalities despite being under very real constraints at times. Curators and archivists suggested over 2,000 objects for the volume. We've whittled down to 280 objects to present and illuminate both individual and collective history and the strength, ingenuity, and vision of American women. New insights from curators' research are represented in chapters incorporating a chronological history of women's impact on our society from pre-colonial times to the present in America, with major contributions to the book from the collections of the National Museum of American History, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Portrait Gallery, and the National Air and Space Museum. We are seeking to restore a history frequently ignored. Curatorial research and collecting efforts have expanded greatly in the past century. Examples of the slow change to hire female staff and to collect specific items related to American women's history are documented, well documented, in the Smithsonian Archives. The institution had been fortunate to have remarkable women in science, in art, history, and culture within our walls as well. 
But nonetheless, records show that for decades in the late 19th and 20th centuries, many women at Smithsonian were volunteers or received little compensation compared to their male colleagues. As we collaborated to produce the volume, many of the Smithsonian scholars, scholars learned new things about the history of their predecessors and collecting over time for the US National Museum and the growing institution. One key objective was to recover the histories of women of color in order to consider a broader understanding of women in America. And the institution's expanded efforts to collect and interpret a more inclusive American history continues into the 21st century. As the Smithsonian Institution commemorates this 19th um, Amendment in, uh, from 1920, we also remembered that the fight for women's voting rights did not end there. It wasn't until 1924 that the Indian Citizenship Act was passed in the United States. But racist policies and obstructive practices in some states still prevented many Native American women from voting in the regular elections. By 1952, the McCarran-Walter Act repealed the race restrictions to Japanese Americans, including women. Although the Voting Rights Act of 1965 prohibited racial discrimination in voting across the nation, the civil rights movement still needed to advocate for practical access to ballot for African American women and for men in many communities. And battles over voter registration laws and voter suppression continue to affect women's access to the franchise to this day. Self-expression, activism, the freedom and the right to work, and to live an equal existence, these themes are all reflected in the struggles and the triumphs of women on the pages of this book that we produced. And I have to say, the book would not have been possible without the work of two of the colleagues who are speaking tonight, Lisa Kathleen Grady and Cecile Gantom. Um, they participated on the editorial team and were fantastic in bringing stories to light uh, that really needed to be told. The diverse collections uh, preserved within the Smithsonian's national collections of art, history and culture and science document some of the most compelling and complex stories of American women and their lasting impact on the nation. We are now able to focus our attention on American women throughout time, bringing them from the sidelines of history to the foreground. These powerful stories demonstrate that it was through women's active struggle to participate in and to contribute to the life of the nation that they saw their rights expanded. And it was through their ambitions and entrepreneurship that they gained footholds in the American economy. It was their hard fought campaigns for the 19th Amendment in public office that brought them into the halls of state and federal government. And it was their contributions to the arts that garnered the US one of the most creative and dynamic art communities in the world. And it was their dedication to health, family, community life, even national defense that connected the domestic to the civic in an ever evolving and developing country. The Smithsonian remains committed to collecting and sharing these diverse women's stories and voices, even as we continue to re-examine what is already within our collections. We're here tonight to continue to inspire, to educate, and engage you in our current work. And now I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speakers, again, who are among the leaders and my colleagues at Smithsonian and great collaborators interpreting the importance of women's history to our nation. We'll each give about a 10 minute talk and then we'll have time for Q&A. First up is going to be Lisa Kathleen Grady, Curator of Political History and Women's History at the National Museum of American History. Lisa researches uh, American political history, reform movements, women's political history, which includes the institution's famous First Ladies collection. And her recent work includes the museum's new exhibition, Creating Icons, How We Remember Women's Suffrage, the Voting Rights section called A, Voice, a Vote and Voice, as co-curator of the exhibition American Democracy, A Great Leap of Faith. And she was also, as I mentioned, author and member of the editorial committee for Smithsonian American Women. Lisa will discuss how the National Women's Suffrage Association, with some help from Smithsonian, created the traditional story of women's suffrage movement and how the story has inspired and caused rifts sometimes in modern women's activism. Next up will be Dr. Crystal Moten. She's curator of African American history in the Division of Work and History at the National Museum of American History. 
She joined us just a year ago and we're so lucky to have her on the Smithsonian team. She's a South Side of Chicago native and previously taught at several small liberal arts colleges on the East Coast and in the Upper Midwest. Her research interests include intersectional connections between the African American labor, business, and civil rights history with emphasis on post-World War II Black freedom movements in the urban West. And Crystal will talk about Black women's political activism and the struggles to make spaces for their voices regarding issues that matter the most to urban communities. And finally tonight, we'll have Cecile Gantome, curator at our Smithsonian's National Museum of American Indian. She joined NMAI's curatorial staff in 1990. And before that, she worked for NMAI's forerunner institution, the Museum of the American Indian, the High Foundation in New York City. She is curator most recently of Developing Stories, Native Photographers in the Field, and she is also co-curator of the NMAI DC exhibition, Americans, and author of that exhibition's companion book, which is called Officially Indian, Symbols That Define the United States. She is uh, editor of the companion publication to the Infinity of Nations exhibition in our New York facility and a frequent contributor to Smithsonian Magazine's blog, Smithsonian Voices. Tonight, Cecile uh, will talk about Native American women and the fight for voting rights. So now I'd like to turn it over to Lisa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Good evening. Um, I'm gonna say hi and then duck out so you can watch the, um, the slides, which are frankly more interesting than, than uh, my blue background. But I'm here to set the stage tonight. So um, I'm gonna say that to say that the story of suffrage is complicating is complicated is putting it mildly. Conflict over competing priorities and philosophies and tactics and goals and alliances all play out over the decades as suffrage is slowly pulled out as a singular issue from the larger world of women's rights and as idealism and activism just ran headlong into practical politics. So my job for the last couple of years, in addition to working on the Smithsonian's book, has been to um, figure out how to explain all of that with the, using the museum's collection, how to relate the, to the past to the present, and to show the rivalries for control and credit for the 19th Amendment that created the story that we all traditionally learn in school, if we learn anything about the American women's suffrage movement, and how its legacy of both inspiration and the distrust engendered by the way that suffrage was won carries over into modern women's activism. And for the Smithsonian, it all starts with a painting, this painting. Okay, sorry, I will say hello and be blue again. In June 1919, shortly after the joint resolution for the 19th Amendment was passed by Congress and went out to the states for ratification, Helen Gardner, who was the vice president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, that's NASA to you and me, approached the Smithsonian with an offer to donate this portrait of Susan B. Anthony. Now, the Smithsonian had turned this portrait down just the year before. But it now accepted it, because what a difference a year and a congressional passage makes, saying that, and I quote, there can be no question of the historical importance of the movement initiated by Miss Anthony and now carried out to a successful ending. If I can have the next slide. This collection it also included the table, it's the round table, on which Elizabeth Cady Stanton drafted the Declaration of Sentiments and other personal relics of Susan B. Anthony, who by now was really being venerated almost as the patron saint of suffrage. Now it's an amazing example of women proudly claiming a place in the National Museum. It's the first time that women have done this and determining for themselves how their story will be told. They curated this collection, they put it on display. So they're determining what they want remembered about their achievements and how that story will be told alongside George Washington and Ulysses S. Grant. But it's definitely their version of the story. Now, when the 19th Amendment was ratified, they, were, they NASA, were absolutely determined that they were the, their organization not the publicity grabbing militants of the rival National Women's Party and their leader, Alice Paul, that NASA would be remembered as leading the long fight 
for women's votes. And they insisted that this display in the Smithsonian must be kept free now and at all times from anything that might connect it in any way with the lawlessness of a few women who never were part of the national and international movement. If I can have the next slide. That would be Alice Ball. And the next slide, and her pickets in front of the White House. And Anthony's niece, Lucy, called this display in the Smithsonian of Susan B. Anthony and NASA material the crowning glory of everything. So, you know, you don't win suffrage and go to the Disney World, you win suffrage and become a part of the Smithsonian. Now, in many ways, the collection really is the material culture version of the story of women's suffrage that's recorded by Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and Ida Houston Harper in their six volume History of Women's Suff Suff Suffrage, excuse me, that was published between 1881 and 1922. Now the authors solicited accounts of the movement for women across the country and then compiled and edited them to emphasize Stanton, Anthony, and uh, NASA's leadership of a coordinated campaign for voting rights. If I can have the next slide. Both the collection and the volumes of history created by NASA to highlight the contributions of their heroines and their successors. It was about credit, but it was also about controlling the image of the suffrage movement and its leaders, and their reputations are somewhat tarnished. Stanton and Anthony were active abolitionists, but opposed the 15th Amendment when it would enfranchise only African American men and not women. After its ratification in 1870, they were committed to obtaining a woman's suffrage amendment. Now, this determination led them and their successors to focus their organizations on voting rights instead of more expansively on women's rights. It also led them to collaborate sometimes with people who did not believe that voting rights should be extended to men and women of all races. Their speeches and writings of this time invoke race, class, education, and nativism as arguments for women's suffrage. Now, the earliest arguments they made in favor of women's suffrage um, used familiar philosophical languages, such as self-evident truths and inalienable rights. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, for her suffrage should be universal, but based on citizen education. So her objection to ignorant, vo ignorant voters in the abstract eventually translated into attacks on immigrants and African Americans. Stanton's, um, voca Stanton's vocabulary periodically degenerated into racial epithets. And decades later, as suffrage was edging to victory, leaders like Carrie Chapman Catt made the case with less philosophy and more pragmatism. In order to win over the remaining states, particularly southern states, in any way necessary, they invoked arguments that, um, for suffrage that would lead to women of color not having voting rights and that suffrage could gain you that. If you want to enfranchise everyone, the 19th Amendment will do it. If on the other hand, you want to invoke white supremacy, establish white supremacy, the 19th Amendment will do that for you too. It's a very useful um, piece, of, uh, piece of legislation. Now these words and calls for exclusion had consequences. African-American women in particular felt betrayed and vulnerable and after 1920, when former white suffragists refused to assist African-American women being denied the vote, this bred mistrust that still lingers. And the arguments and actions that they embraced are remembered alongside the victory that they won. So the memories of the suffrage movement can be both inspirational and disappointing, as battles over diversity continue to mark the struggle for women's rights. If I can have the next slide. So to mark the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, we wanted to create an exhibit that would look at who was missing from the story that we learn in school and at how a movement's memory can be joyous and inspirational and disappointing and a call to action and a cautionary tale all at the same time. So we paired the story of suffrage with two events where the inspirational memory as well as the struggle for diversity left over from su the suffrage past played a part. So I can have the next slide. So in 1977, 2,000 delegates gathered in Houston, Texas for the first 
federally funded first really uh, in many, many years, women's conference. Now this was the most purposely diverse and demographically representative group ever assembled in the United States. States were to send delegates representing their um, demographics of their state to debate proposals promoting equal rights and ending discrimination toward women that would be sent to the president and Congress for action. For many white delegates, it was the first time they had met or talked at length with women of color with life experiences different from their own. The organizers expected disagreement between liberal and conservative delegates, but they did not anticipate that issues of poverty, education, employment, and safety were of equal or greater priority for feminists of color than was the ERA. If I can have the next slide. But it was an event that consciously drew on suffrage memory uh, for inspiration. Um, the NASA leaders were probably rolling in their graves, but this uh, version of the movement honored Alice Paul, the original author of the ERA and the leader of the pickets. Vendors at the conference sold buttons with her name and reproductions of Jail for Freedom pins. African American, if I can have the next slide, sorry. African American poet Maya Angelou um, linked suffrage, activism, past and present, to, for in, to form a more perfect union. Now, this declaration acknowledged history's positive achievements to inspire us and its negative omissions to teach us. The declaration committed participants in the conference to honor the famous and the unsung, to recognize the challenges that others face, and to seek justice for all women. I have the next slide. And in 2017, women came out to demonstrate again. Angered by the language of the 2016 presidential campaign and worried about a political culture that was misogynistic and attacked equality for people of color, immigrants, and the LGBTQ community, hundreds of thousands of women took to the streets in the nation's capital and millions more joined them in sister marches, <clears throat> excuse me, across the country and the world. They hoped to revitalize the women's movement and send a message that women would continue to fight for social justice. I can have the next slide. Women of color who felt marginalized since the suffrage movement took this opportunity to remake feminist activism in their own images. Um, but it also drew on a suffrage past and they come, uh, many, for many participants, they invoked the uh, suffragists in 1913 who had also marched down Pennsylvania Avenue, overwhelming the streets of Washington DC the day before a presidential inauguration as they uh, marched for suffrage. And the, this idea that we're still marching was very strong out there that day. Now we hope, if I can have the next slide, we hope that the exhibit um, creating icons, how we remember suffrage, woman suffrage, will open people up to the idea that suffrage is complicated, contradictory, and that the results uh, were both positive, negative, and long-lasting. And to talk more fully about that, um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Crystal Moten. Greetings, everyone. I am very happy to be with all of you today um, to share um, what I would like to talk about tonight. As you've heard so far from my colleagues, um, we know the struggle for women's right to vote um, was not, is not a simple story. And this year, while we recognize the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, a fuller story of, the, of women's struggle to vote is still being written um, even to this day. So today I wanna to center my remarks on African-American women's history in order, to, in order to uncover how they saw voting as part of what I refer to as a toolkit for freedom and justice. We can advance the next slide. Um, in addition to uh, voting and electoral politics, other tools that black women deployed in their fight for freedom and justice included religious activism and participation, organizational development, economic participation, educational attainment and leadership. And many times when black women um, did not have access to, to the ballot, they use many of these other tools in their toolkits to fight for freedom and justice for their communities around this nation. And so I really wanna underscore um, that this toolkit included a lot of different strategies and tactics. 
thinking about African American history and the history of voting rights for African American communities, we know that the ratification of the 15th Amendment um, allowed Black men to vote. But historians have uncovered during this period of voting during the Reconstruction era that for African American communities, voting was communal. Historians like Dr. Elsa Barkley Brown have written about how Black families and communities came together to discuss who was on the ballot and how the ballot would be cast. Next slide. In this process, Black women made their choices known and their voices heard such that Black men did not vote on behalf of, of himself alone, but of his family and of his community. And so although Black uh, women um, did not gain the right to vote with the 15th Amendment, there was a communal process in which they were allowed to make their voices and their choices known um, through dialogue and discussion with the men in their lives who could vote. After Reconstruction failed and by the early 1900s, most states in the South put in place laws that restricted all Black people's access to, the, to voting. And these restrictions included poll taxes, grandfather clauses, literacy tests, and violent reprisals from white supremacists. This meant that most Black people um, in the South could not access the right to vote until the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was mentioned earlier this evening. Because of the recent passing of the Honorable John Lewis, many of us have the story of the Voting Rights Act and that passage in 1965 and the role that uh, the community of Selma played in that in the, in the front of our minds. It's more in the public consciousness as we remember and recognize uh, Congressman John Lewis. And it would be this Voting Rights Act of 1965 which actually enforces the 15th Amendment and results in the removal of barriers that will restrict access to voting. And so that's where I want to, I want to pick up. I want to pick up and focus my, um, my contribution on the years between 1920 and 1965 by considering the voting stories of women who we may not have known in, a reg in regions of the United States that we might not have considered. Focusing on these women reveals the fact that geography matters when discussing the struggle for voting rights in this country. Next slide, please. In 1920, when the 19th Amendment was fully ratified, African Americans were in the midst of a massive migration that occurred in this country between 1916 and 1917. And you can see uh, information about that migration on your screen. But for context, in the year 1900, on, um, only or about 740,000 African Americans lived outside the South, and that was just about 8% of the nation's total Black population. Between 1910 and 1930, the African American population increased by about 40% in Northern states as a result of the migration. And this, uh, most African Americans did migrate to major cities, Chicago, Detroit, New York City, um, between the 1940s and the 1970s, more movement and migration happened um, toward the West, and so included uh, California and other points westward. And so it's really important to think about this period between 1920 and 1965 as a period of mass migration and mass movement. By 1970, more than 10.6 million African Americans lived outside the South, and that was 47% of the nation's total. All right, so at the moment in 1920, um, when um, some women are gaining um, the right to vote, African Americans are in the midst of this large, great migration um, that affects who can vote um, and when based on their geography. And so again, as we complicate what voting means to diverse communities across the United States, it's important to consider the importance of region and migration when considering the voting story. As a result of migration and movement, as well as patterns of racial segregation outside of the South, this opened the doors for Black women to participate in, in electoral politics outside of the South. And so I want to share the stories of um, three of these women 
who, who participated in electoral politics, um, who voted, and then who were elected um, to office and what they achieved for their communities as a result of their election. The first person I want to focus on is Charlotta Bass. You can go to the next slide. Uh, Charlotta Bass um, resided for much of her life in Los Angeles, California, but she was actually born in Sumter, South Carolina. She also lived in Rhode Island and she eventually moved to California in 1910. Uh, while she was in Rhode Island, she um, sold ads for a black owned newspaper called the Providence Watchman. And when she moved to California, she continued on in the newspaper business, but this time taking control of an African American newspaper called the Eagle. When she took control of the Eagle after the publisher died, she renamed it the California Eagle. The newspaper highlighted, highlighted issues affecting Black people such as police brutality, restrictive housing, um, and it exposed white supremacist organizations such as the KKK. She was the leader um, and, uh, and the publisher of the California Eagle for several decades and she retired from the newspaper in 1951 when she decided to devote um, the rest of her time and her life to electoral politics. Because of her long time work with the Progressive Party, the party chose her as its VP uh, vice presidential candidate. And, and because of this, she's the first African American woman nominated for vice president as part of that Progressive um, party, um, party ticket in 1952. While she did not win, her campaign slogan was, win or lose, we win by raising the issues. All right, and so for Charlotta Bass, as a media person, as a journalist, someone interested in the, in the dissemination of news and information about African American communities, she saw it as her job to disseminate and publicize um, information about the issues affecting African Americans in California, in Los Angeles, and she did this through both um, her newspaper work and then her, her political work. We can move on to our next person, who is Nellie Stone Johnson. Nellie Stone Johnson um, was born in Minnesota. She was born in Dakota County, and she grew up on a farm. Her, her parents were farmers. In 1922, she moved to Minneapolis to go to high school. And in, in Minneapolis, she became politicized because of her meetings and engagements and discussions with activists, with socialists and communists. Um, and this really um, sparked in her a desire to work on behalf of working people um, in Minneapolis and in Minnesota. As a result of this, she joins the Minneapolis National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And she also assists truck drivers in a citywide strike to better their working conditions. As a result of her work at a local hotel, she participated in union, union organizing with the union at that hotel, and she was eventually elected vice president of her local um, union. In the midst of, of participating in her local union and participating in the uh, Minneapolis NAACP, she also was participating in the uh, Minnesota Democrat and Farm Labor Party. And as a member of this party in 1945, she was elected to the Minneapolis Library Board. And this made her the first African American to hold elected office in the state of Minnesota. And so this is a really important uh, point to consider, especially when we think about um, the types of political positions that we typically uh, think about. Like we, we typically think about alder people or mayors or governors or Congress people, but we have to also think about the local positions um, that um, people were being elected to and, and the importance of being elected to the library board um, in Minneapolis and that um, being um, her being um, the first um, African-American to be elected in that position. Two years later, in 1947, she helps campaign to pass legislation to create the Minneapolis Fair Employment Commission. 
would make which would make the state um, responsible and responsive to eradicating um, employment and discrimination across the state. In 1963, she retired from the hotel industry. She became an entrepreneur. She opened her own tailoring business in downtown Minneapolis, but she continued her political activism for several more decades. The quote you see on, your, on the screen, um, it says, I've always been preaching a simple message, jobs, jobs, jobs. I'd say even then, what good does it do if we can go into nice restaurants if we can't afford to order in them? And so for Nellie Stone Johnson, the connection between her political work, um, her electoral position, um, and economic justice was an interconnected one. And so she used her political positioning um, to agitate for better jobs, fair jobs, equal jobs for um, African Americans in her community. Um, the last person I want to uh, tell you a story about is Vel Phillips, and I apologize that the line is um, through her, um, her life dates, but that should be uh, 1924 to 2018. Um, Vel Phillips was born in 1924 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She attended um, undergraduate here, where I am right now, in Washington, D.C. at Howard University. After she graduated from Howard University, she moved back to Wisconsin and she um, uh, married her, uh, her lifelong partner and they both attended law school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1951. And this made her the first African-American woman um, to graduate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Law School. Um, uh, Belle Phillips, had been a member of a number of organizations, including the League of Women Voters, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the Milwaukee um, NAACP. Um, and this participation in these organizations um, that were concerned about African American um, um, development, social, political, economic development, um, it sparked within her a desire to run for office so, she, so that she could work on issues that affected African Americans in her community. And so in 1956, when she was in her 30s, uh, she ran for a position on Milwaukee's Common Council. And because of the, the ways in which gender discrimination functioned, she shortened her name from Velva, Velva, excuse me, Velvalia to Vel, so that people would not know that she was a woman. And she did not put her image on her campaign materials. And so it was only when she would show up to her campaigning um, that people would see that she was a woman. And so in 1956, she became the first African American and the first woman to be elected to Milwaukee's Common Council as an alder person. And as an alder person, uh, she took as her main challenge the fight and the struggle for fair and equal housing in the city. So starting in 1962, she introduced the Phillips Housing Ordinance, which would outlaw housing discrimination in the city. But she could not convince her fellow alders to, um, to pass the bill, and the bill was defeated 18 to 1. So she was the only one who voted for that bill. Everyone else voted against it. And so between 1963 and 1967, she would reintroduce the bill repeatedly, and repeatedly her peers would refuse to pass it. It was not until there were uh, there was tremendous civil rights action and activism um, in 1967 that included protests and demonstrations and over 200 days of marching, as well as the 1968 assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, those events prompted the Common Council to finally pass the city's uh, fair um, housing legislation. In 1971, uh, Governor Patrick Lucy appointed um, Attorney Phillips to the Milwaukee Circuit Court, and this made her the first African American judge in Wisconsin. On the screen, she said, my mother would always tell me, if you really want to do it, don't dream small dreams, dream big dreams. Um, in, an, in, a, in an interview um, that uh, Vel Phillips did, she thought, she mentioned that she thought being the first um, African American woman to graduate from the University of Wisconsin Madison Law School would be kind of the biggest thing she did in her life. But 
um, that was not the only thing and the biggest thing that she did in her life. She made so many other contributions. So I only had time to focus on and even cursorily on these three women um, and there are books and um, memoirs that these women have written themselves about their lives and I would encourage you to do more research to learn more about them. Um, but these stories illustrate kind of the diversity of black women's experiences as it related to voting um, as it related to electoral politics and focusing on women and the, and their struggles outside of the South. As a result of the great migration, uh, black women in the North, Midwest and West did vote and they did participate in electoral politics between 1920 and 1965. But I wanna remind you that again, voting was not the only tool in their toolkit. And, but once they voted, they used this political tool to address the issues that impacted black people, such as, as I mentioned, police brutality, discrimination in employment and segregated house housing. It is my hope that learning about these women, again, would pique your interest to learn more, to understand that voting and voting rights, especially as they relate to Black women, is not a simple story. It's a really complicated one. But then also to think about what women, what women did with the vote after they cast their ballots. Thank you. And I want to turn it over now to my colleague, uh, Cecile Garcon, who will talk about um, Native American women and their struggles in the fight for um, equal voting rights. Thank you, Crystal and Michelle, for your introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, the issues surrounding Native American women and voting rights has less to do with their gender than the fact that they're indigenous peoples living in the United States. This is because with the passage of the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act, which extended birthright citizenship to all Native Americans born within the country, Native Americans voting rights were controlled by state law and many states placed provisions in their constitutions that barred Native Americans from voting. They claim, for example, that Native Americans were not residents of their states because they lived on reservations or that they were not competent to vote because they were, quote, wards of the government. Arizona and New Mexico both had such provisions in their constitutions. And when they were struck down in 1948, the rulings were hailed as landmark rulings recognizing Native Americans' right to vote in US elections. Still, it wasn't until 1955 that Native Americans living on reservations in Maine could vote, and not until 1962 when Utah became the last state to remove its formal barriers, that Native Americans were granted voting rights in every state in the United States. But still, even after 1962, many Native Americans still face voter suppression. Now, the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and subsequent legislation did enable increasing and successful voter rights litigation by Native Americans. Yet as recently as 2018, obstacles still existed. North Dakota's refusal to accept tribal identification cards as documentation when registering to vote, and their insistence that voters have physical addresses rather than PO boxes, denied Native Americans in that state the ability to participate in the democratic process. The fact is the struggle to gain and secure voting rights for all Native Americans is ongoing. And so the question before us this evening is where throughout the last 100 years have Native American women been in championing Native American voting rights? Well, from the days of suffragists Marie Louise Baldwin and Gertrude Bonin to the days of US Congresswoman Deb Holland and Sharice Davids, there have always been Native American who have understood that there have always been Native American women who have understood that voting matters and have been fiercely committed to fighting whatever obstacles lay in Native Americans past to being full participants in democracy. So let's now look at a few of these remarkable women. Marie Louise Baldwin was born in 1863 in North Dakota. A member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa, she was formally educated and eventually became a clerk in her father's law office. Her father fought for Turtle Mountain Chippewa treaty rights. In the early 1890s, she moved with him to Washington, D.C. and became involved in a community of professional Native Americans who lived and worked in the capital. 
In 1904, Baldwin began working in the Office of Indian Affairs. She posed for her staff photograph wearing traditional clothing. Contemporary Native academics regard this as a political act on Baldwin's part, expressing her views against her employer's handling of Native American affairs. The photograph is thought to date to the year Baldwin joined the Society of American Indians, the first professional association of Native Americans organized to advocate for Native American civil rights. The society's activism coincided with that of the suffrage movement, and Baldwin was an active member of the suffragists movement as well as the society. She participated in the 1930 women's suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. Having, having just become an attorney, she marched up Pennsylvania Avenue alongside other women lawyers. In 1914, she was among a group of key suffragists who met with President Woodrow Wilson to encourage him to support women's suffrage. Staunchly opposed at the time, Wilson would, of course, reverse his stance and publicly endorse women's voting rights in 1918. Another prominent early spokeswoman for Native American voting rights was Gertrude Bonin. Bonin was born on the Yankton Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. She was educated in the Whites Indians Manual Labor Institute, a residential school run by Quakers. Government and missionary run schools for Native American children were intended to stamp out their Native identities and assimilate them into mainstream society. But Bonwin, who would go on to study at Earlham College and the Boston Conservatory of Music, used her formal education and fluency in English to advocate for reform in Native American affairs. In 1916, she was selected secretary of the Society of American Indians and served on the board of editors of the society's journal, the American Indian Magazine. In its pages, she called attention to the irony that first Americans lacked the rights of other Americans, even though thousands of Native men, including her husband, fought for the country in World War I. She argued for citizenship and enfranchisement of Native American men and women. Interestingly, although she lived in DC at the pinnacle of the suffrage movement, Bonin placed Native voting rights within it within an even larger global and humanitarian context. In an editorial reflecting on the Paris Peace Conference at the end of World War I, she concluded by writing, the white man asked for a very simple thing, citizenship in the land that was once his own, America. Who shall represent his cause at the World Peace Conference? The American Indian, too, made the supreme sacrifice for liberty's sake. He loves democratic ideals. What shall world democracy mean to his race? There never was a time more opportune than now for America to enfranchise the red man. In 1926, Bonin co-founded the National Council of American Indians and used her platform as president to track legislation concerning Native American rights promote legislation in their favor, and educate Native Americans on the power of the ballot. Aglala Lakota Helen Peterson, born in 1959 on the Pine Ridge Reservation, served as executive director of the National Congress of American Indians from 1953 until 1961. Established in 1944, the NCAI is now the oldest advocacy organization for Native Americans. Peterson considered Native Americans' voting record, as well as voting rights, critical to their ability to defend their own self-interest. In 1948, she wrote an essay entitled American Indian Political Participation. In it, she identified issues concerning Native American voting rights. The issues ranged from U.S. government officials interfering in tribal government functions, including tribal elections, to the intentional lack of involvement of Native Americans in the writing of state referendums directly impacting their lives, and from Utah's revival of an 1897 statute in the 1950s to defend its denial of Native American voting rights. 
two, Native American voting habits in local and regional elections. A strong advocate of Native American voter education programs, Peterson's tenure at the NCAI saw increasing numbers of Native Americans registering to vote in regional and national elections. Jacqueline de Leon of the Isleta Pueblo is an, is an attorney. Next slide, please. Jacqueline de Leon of the Isleta Pueblo is an attorney at the Native Americans Rights Fund. Focused on ending Native American voter suppression, she knows that the fight for equal rights for Native Americans has not only been long, but arduous. For the last several years, she has helped, a series, she has held, helped lead a series of nine field hearings in seven states on Native American voting rights and practices. She and her colleagues have compiled and contextualized testimony from Native peoples about barriers they face when they try to vote. Dillion and her colleagues' work resulted in the publication Obstacles at Every Turn, Barriers to Political Participation Faced by Native American Voters. It spells out the work remaining to be done to ensure that Native Americans can elect candidates of their choice. Finally, I'll end with Congresswoman Deborah Holland of Mexico and a member of the Pueblo Laguna and Sharice Davids of Kansas, a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation. In 2018, they made history when they became the first Native American women to be elected in the U.S. Congress. They are co-sponsors of the Native American Voting Rights Act, introduced by Senator Tom Udall and Representative Ben Ray Lujan in 2019. This legislation seeks to finally ensure that Native Americans have equal access to the electoral process. Voting is the very foundation of our democracy, says Davids. We need Native American voting rights to ensure that everyone has equal access to make their voices heard in our democracy, says Congresswoman Holland. Throughout the last 100 years, remarkable women have been armed with a deep knowledge of U.S. American Indian history, U.S. federal Indian policy, U.S. legislative processes, and knowing that Native people are their own best spokespeople have understood the power of the ballot and have fought those hostile to Native American voting. With their great efforts, the fight for equal voting rights for Native Americans may soon finally be won. Thank you. Tricia, over to you. All right, um, thank you, um, Michelle and Lisa Kathleen and Crystal and Cecile. That was so wonderful and um, there are so many great comments in the chat, just people talking about these remarkable women that you highlighted, um, you know, talking about the be beautiful photos of them, you know, things like rock on Ms. Baldwin in reaction to your presentation, Cecile, um, just some really wonderful, wonderful comments about how inspirational um, that the, the women that you've highlighted and the stories that you shared really are. Um, there's a number of questions I'm seeing if there is going to be a recording available. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, we are recording it and we're going to share the link out to everyone who registered um, in the coming days so you can take a look for that. Um, and let's see, there's just some wonderful comments. I'm going to, I'm going to start with a couple of questions um, that we, we actually discussed in the preparation for this and then moved to some things that came up, have come up in the Q&A in the chat. Um, Lisa, Kathleen, one of the things that I thought was so interesting as we were preparing this, and I really learned a lesson in the difference between calling someone a suffragist and a suffragette. And I would love it if you would talk a little bit about those terms and what they mean and what we should be using. Sorry, I had to find the mute button. Um, in America, we are suffragists. In Britain, it, it, the, they are suffragettes. And this is, a suffragette was hurled at Mrs. Pankhurst and the British suffragists as a, as a slur. And as women frequently do, they took it themselves and turned it around and embraced it as a word that would show their defiance and their, um, their collegiality. Most Americans picked up suffragette, you know, I always blame Mary Poppins, Mrs. Banks and, uh, and Sister Suffragette or David Bowie. Um, 
and and that's that's the word that we know. And when Alice Paul, who trained in Britain with uh, with Mrs. Pankhurst, went on uh, hung, was imprisoned, went on hunger strikes. That's the j idea for the Jailed for Freedom pin comes from the Holloway Prison Gate pin that she was awarded for going on hunger strike in Britain. When she comes back to the United States ready to energize the movement with all of these radical methods uh, she learned from the British. The one thing that NASA is afraid of is that they will be tarred as suffragettes, as violent suffragettes, because the suffragettes did break windows, they did property damage, they set fire to empty buildings, they poured acid down post boxes. Now, the American suffragists didn't do that. Alice Paul is a Quaker, and that is not how she's, she, she doesn't feel that these tactics are gonna work in the United States. Um, and so to differentiate themselves from the suffragettes, they embrace the word suffragist and they, they push back on suffragette. But you'll see it in newspaper coverage and especially in anti-suffrage material that they're, they're called suffragettes. But in, in, America, in America, we are suffragists. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, like I said, that was such a lesson for me and I'm really glad I learned it. So now I can use the appropriate term. Um, there, um, Crystal, there's a couple of questions for you. Um, one is, um, what was the demographic composition of the Progressive Party in the 1950s? And was the presidential candidate also a person of color? All right, thanks for the, um, the question. Um, the presidential candidate was, uh, was not a person of color, it was Vincent Hallinan who was a, um, a lawyer in um, California. I don't have the specific demographics of the party at my disposal um, right now, um, but the, the ticket, uh, did, it actually did not do very well. Of course, you know, they didn't win. Um, and of course, Charlotte Bass was the only um, uh, black woman on, on that ticket, so. Thank you. And one of the um, comments that came up in the chat when you were presenting Crystal was from Andrea who said, all of these ladies lived amazingly long lives and very active throughout their lives. I guess senior citizen didn't mean be quiet or your voice is no longer relevant. And I think that's such a wonderful um, lesson to keep in mind today. Yeah, uh, definitely, I agree. And, and for some of the women, um, their political careers didn't begin till after retirement, right? And so that's even something um, to consider that, um, you know, we can make our long lives as useful as we can in the ways that we can. And we can um, use kind of uh, these women as inspiration toward doing that. Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, to me, there's such there was such relevance in the women that you highlighted and the stories that you told. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about the quotes that you shared, um, like Charlotta Bass saying, Bass saying, you know, we, you know, it's all about the issues. We raise the issues. And um, Nellie Stone Johnson saying it's jobs, jobs, jobs. And Val Phillips talking about we got to dream big. And these seem so relevant to what we hear today. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, how do you, when there is such, there seems such to be such relevance and crossover, how do you think about this history today in the context of contemporary conversations that still talk about voter disenfranchisement or in voting rights, voting suppression, things like that? I mean, how do you see the parallels there? Um, what what these women um, and their political activism show me um, and what it what it teaches me is to always hold the broader context in, in my hand in my purview right and so thinking again as I mentioned about this toolkit um, that voting was one part of that but they were also concerned about education and employment um, and health which I didn't talk about um, and so thinking about um, how all of these are interconnected and, inter and intersected. And so in some ways, um, while these women, um, some of them held electoral, electoral positions, they were also active in other grassroots and local community organizations on the ground trying to affect change in their communities. And so they were active in a number of different levels, using a number of different tools and strategies to make change in their communities. And so that will be the lesson that I, that I take for today um, is that while we may have a singular issue that could be bubbling up to the surface, there are um, multiple ways that we can get involved um, in our local communities to affect change um, in interconnected ways. Thank you. Um, and Cecile, there's a question 
um, for you about um, of this. Uh, what is the current status of using PO boxes or Google addresses to ensure native voting rights? Well, in North Dakota, the tribes there had a huge uh, victory just February of this year when they were able to get the state laws and regulations um, changed. So, for the, so in North Dakota, it's been a victory for the tribes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I can, sorry, I just wanted to jump in and say one of the things I think the museums, I know our museum is really trying to, to help people understand, and we do this in the American Democracy Exhibit, is that while we all throw around terms like the right to vote, people don't have the right to vote. The way the United States is structured, you do not have a, a positive right to vote granted to you in the United States Constitution. There are a series of amendments that tell you why you can't be discriminated against, say because of sex or the color of your skin, but states control voting rights. States control voter registration, so states can come up with any workarounds they want to select a pool of voters. And what we really, as, mu as man many times as we like to use the wonderful words like right to vote, what we really want people to come away remembering is that you have to fight for the right to vote. And you have, the, and I said it, the right to vote. You have to fight to get your ballot and then you have to fight to keep your ballot. And it can be taken away from you any, at any moment. And the voting is an ebbing and flowing line throughout American history. And it, it behooves all of us to be vigilant to keep, to keep it in our hands. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Um, there's another, um, um, I think any of you can answer this, whoever feels comfortable jumping in. Uh, we have a question from Jan. Um, could you talk more about the other kinds of barriers that women faced when they tried to vote. For example, the voter registration places in 1920 Wilmington, North Carolina were extremely male spaces. Uh, white women complained about going to the stable and the fire station to register. And there were many more barriers for black women, voters in the South and elsewhere. Um, I'm just wondering if you could expand on the tactics used for voter suppression um, despite, despite the 19th and the 15th amendments. Crystal is sh shaking her yet, his head yes. I think she's got something to say. Yeah, I do have something to say, and, and particularly thinking about um, the ways that uh, gender informed, again, the geography and the access to the right to vote, right? And so thinking about um, the ways in which um, public and private were defined, public and private space were defined in this country, and how that um, kind of created barriers for Black, uh, for women's political participation. And when I think about um, kind of voting um, in the South and think about my colleague's point just now about barriers that um, states erected um, that um, prohibited the right, uh, pro prohibited the access of Black people to the ballot, it included things um, such as um, paying a poll tax, right? And if you couldn't pay a poll tax, whether you were black or white, that was a barrier to voting, right? So your economic ability um, um, could, could contribute to your lack of access. In, uh, in the South, in, in several states in the South, uh, there were also these kind of silly tests like um, a, the soap test, how many bubbles in a, on a bar of soap. And if you couldn't guess correctly, you were not allowed, um, you, you could not exercise uh, the right to vote. Um, also literacy tests. If you could not interpret interpret the Constitution, right, you did not um, voter registration. And so these things um, were both uh, race and class, right, and they affected poor white people as well, uh, poor white women um, as well. And I want to kind of make that point about the ways in which class affected this as well. Um, location and geography has also been an issue for Native Americans. Now, most Native Americans um, live in cities, not on uh, reservations, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of Native folks do. And they're very large and they're very rural. And, the, and where um, registration stations and voting stations are set up is a, is a big issue for how easy it is or uh, for Native people to get to those stations. Another issue that affected Native people in voting is language. And with the um, Voting Rights Act, 
um, native languages were recognized as minority languages. And so it did become law that voting materials had to be in within whatever region they're in within native languages as well. And also that translators had to be made available at voting and registration locations. Great. Um, there's a, a, a question in the in the Q and A about um, you know that the, the only reference to being jailed in our in our talk tonight was the pendant that or the pin that you showed, Lisa Kathleen. Um, and um, Catherine Johnson says there were many women beaten, raped while incarcerated, brutalized, etc. Um, how do we represent that? You're, I, you're muted if you're trying to talk. <laughs> I keep forgetting to turn it on and off. <laughs> we try to tell holistic stories and then individual stories so that you, you can, can say something is happening and then hear some particular instances of it happening, where it's happening at different points in time to different people in different circumstances. Um, one of the hardest things of talking about history of a very a large swath of time is that it's so easy to say something that makes it sound as if this was happening all the time to all people and so trying to trying to tell the individual stories and put them in context of the whole sweep of time especially a time period as long as the suff the suffrage time period um, is is something we just have to work on. We tell, um, I know we tell story, we specifically tell the jailed for freedom story, which are the pickets being arrested in front of the White House for obstructing traffic and how they would be brutalized in, in, in prison. When we, interestingly, other kinds of stories we tell more in the context of civil rights in our museum. I don't know why. Um, I don't think it's intentional. I think it's just, that select that, that stories move into into different areas sometimes where the sometimes where they make the most impact and for whatever reason in the in the sort of straight line narrative of of suffrage the jailed for freedom moment is a is a because it had such a public um, response bec because the publicity that it generated was very specific um, it's it's a story we concentrate on there and when I think of other exhibits we've done, a lot of those stories have ended up in what we would, where, where we would be talking about, um, so, although civil and voting rights in that one section, we, we, we talk about that as well. And I'm sounding very confused, but it's, it's, it's just a question of where it fits in the best in a museum. It's where it fits in the best with the narrative you're telling, with the objects you've got to work with, and the the story as it's flowing through. There's something about working in 30 word chunks that that make you concentrate your effort and find the story that's most evocative through material culture. And sometimes it's hard to tell those stories with material culture. It's one of the reasons jailed for freedom can be used because we have these little pieces that help us tell that story. But you don't necessarily have those that the material culture to tell those stories in other contexts. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think that um, as we know, we're constantly learning and filling in gaps of history and, and for museums, I think it's as we build our collections, we're also able to tell different um, and more complex and more nuanced stories. Um, so what we started with those early early objects that you talked about, Lisa Kathleen, you know, we've built upon that and now we can tell different stories and hopefully that will continue as we continue to collect and continue our scholarship in this area. Um, so we're, um, I want to, we have so many questions and I like, we could probably stay on like two more hours, <laughs> um, just addressing them all. Um, we will follow up with everyone with some additional resources in addition to the link that we'll send you of the recording. Um, but I do have a question for Michelle. Um, you were the editor of this fantastic book that we mentioned in the beginning. And I'm curious, I know like curators always hate when you ask, what's your favorite object? But I'm wondering um, if there's a story or an object from the book that um, you just love, or if there's something that like didn't make the cut, but you really wish it had, like, is there a kind of behind the scenes look that you could give us into that? There are some collections that are in the book that really show how we've collected across Smithsonian. Marian Anderson, uh, you know, and her, her 
um, singing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1939 and the story behind that and the objects that have been collected. Um, there's just some very special moments. Uh, uh, the uh, National Museum of African American History uh, and Culture was able to participate in this book just after they opened up and, and making sure that those stories were told. Uh, and Emmett Till's story and his mother's story, uh, Mamie, really important. Uh, and, and how we bring in uh, parts of the museums uh, and, and across the institution, we've grown so much in the past 50 years to have Cecile and her colleagues and now my colleagues at the National Museum of American Indian uh, bring the stories forward that were unheard before. And that's where I think um, introducing curators to one another, bringing this collection, thinking about, you know, within weeks we had 2,000 objects to think about and now we also know where some of the gaps are. Uh, I would have loved to have more photography in there uh, with my background, uh, but there's always room for more. And I hope that our work inspires um, both our colleagues at Smithsonian and also in affiliations to think about new projects, to, to be inspired, uh, to think about the opportunities to collaborate with Smithsonian and to think about what projects we should be doing in the future. Great, thanks. Um, and I think for one last question to wrap up the evening, I'm going to tweak the question that was asked just a little bit, but Amy is asking about um, whether you have any suggestions, um, and I'm going to ask, drawing from the his your historical research, your, the scholarship, um, for suggestions of how we can best protect not only our individual rights to vote, but also those of others. Is there anything that you've learned that you say, you know, is there, are there lessons from the, the toolkit crystal or um, Michelle and Cecile and Michelle, are there, uh, Lisa, Michelle and Cecile, are there lessons from other parts of your scholarship that you say, these are some things that we could be thinking about um, today and in the future? Yeah, the thing that I would like to uh, contribute um, is that the women who I talked about today and the num numerous women who I did not talk about, they remained engaged. Um, they didn't um, stay passively in the background, kind of letting events sweep over them, but they jumped right in. They kept engaged. They continued to educate themselves and continue to um, be active in causes that, that were important to them and their communities. Um, and so I think that's, that's, that's a couple of things <laughs> we can do. Anyone else? I would say that one of the, thi one of the things we really try and, and um, make known to people when they, when they come through, the, say, the voting rights section of one of the exhibits is that the whole idea of extending voting rights is people coming to a place of willingness and comfort with sharing power with people who may think differently than they do. And where voting rights are effective is when people can come to that realization that just because somebody doesn't have my experience or maybe has my top priority, we don't share the same top priority, our broader view we can work together or we can at least, you know, challenge it out and you'll win today and I'll win tomorrow. We will, we will be able to work together to come to some kind of, of consensus or agreement and that when you fight for each other's rights is when we can all move forward together. And that's, it's, you, you can see it so clearly when people can think beyond their own particular needs and take on the needs of other people when, when empathy can become more than feeling. And we try and do of that because that's that's kind of what will get you engaged and working and knowing that it's for a, a, a bigger cause than yourself. Thank you. And to that, I just add for um, clearly for Native American women activists and Native American activists, um, they realized very, very early on that um, if they were going to get anywhere um, for, for justice for their people, it was going to have to be a multi-pronged approach that they'd have to, that have to be lobbyists, that have to work through the electoral process, that have to work with the court, through the courts, and they'd have to get people elected. And, and that's what they've been doing. I think those are um, excellent words to end on. Um, Michelle, I'll turn it back over to you if you have any final comments that you'd like to share with um, our affiliates and their communities. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for um, 
Patricia and crew for uh, pulling this together this evening. We've all learned so much. There's so much more research to do. Uh, and I hope that we can uh, learn from each other and continue to partner uh, with our museums across the nation to bring these stories to the forefront and get the local communities thinking about all these leaders, all these strong women who have persevered over time and who's out there right now uh, during this important year and the future to continue to bring uh, those um, opportunities that we want to have to make a difference to vote and to impact our nation's history. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for bringing the stories to our attention and uh, for considering what's next for Smithsonian and our collaborations. Thanks. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, as we mentioned, we'll be sending the recording out in the coming days. Um, there's our website um, and the, web, the site for the Women's History Initiative at Smithsonian if you want to learn more. Um, thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.